So in some previous lectures on reliability, I went through some of the reliability improvements you can get through manual switching. And what we're gonna do in this lecture is we're gonna focus on the improvements you can get from automated switching. This is sometimes referred to as feeder automation, but um, we're gonna kind of talk about this more in the context of the, the fault location, isolation and service restoration steps we talked about before. It's just this time we're gonna look at ways we can automate this and speed things up. So as far as the topics I'm gonna to go through, I wanted to kind of double back and talk a little bit more about what a conventional outage management system does. Because utilities already have processes in place for helping to restore service once an outage happens. What the FLISR system I'm gonna be talking about will do is it'll actually allow you to take certain feeders and through automation, speed up the process on certain feeders, which is, is needed usually because those feeders are subject to more faults or subject to more outages. And so utilities will tend not to do 100% feeder automation. What they'll do is they'll target those feeders which are more susceptible and then focus on those feeders. And so that's gonna be talking about today is how we can you know, automate maybe some of the problem feeders. So I wanna go back and talk about the, the FLISR steps in, in a little bit more detail this time. Uh, talk about what's involved in doing fault detection location and then what are some things we could do to automate that. And then we'll look at the isolation and service restoration as well in, in not automated and automated systems. Uh, then we'll get into more specific hardware solutions. So we'll talk a little bit about fault current indicators and how we can do distance calculations. And then get into the hardware that's required for doing the fault isolation and service restoration. And the common schemes that are used today are, are usually on what we call loop systems. And so we'll get into talking about how we can do this on loop systems. And then the last part of this, I'll go through an example on doing a loop control and we'll take a look at some of the cost benefit ratios for different types of solutions. So in, in the video for, for part A, I'll break this into three parts. For the first part, I'll talk about outage management, sometimes called OMS, and then what's involved in non-automated versus automated FLISR. Uh, part B, we'll get into the hardware and logic solutions and part C, we'll do the example. So we haven't talked that much this semester about utility applications associated with distribution. And this is kind of another whole course on its own. But what you have above the SCADA are a number of different components for distribution that are sometimes referred to as distribution management systems. In fact, nowadays, you may hear people talk about ADMS, which is the second generation, which would be advanced distribution management systems. And so what we would have built on top of SCADA, where SCADA, what, what SCADA would do is it would actually link up to all the devices in the field. Uh, what the SCADA system does is it basically pulls devices in the substation like relays. It'll pull like circuit breakers and voltage regulators and get all the state measurements associated with the substation. You also have the ability of <clears throat> getting data from feeder level devices. And so you'd be talking to reclosers and switch capacitor banks, uh, line regulators, maybe uh, fault current indicators as well. And what SCADA does is it pulls all this information together and gives you some um, indication of what's going on in your system. Excuse me. And then what distribution management does is it takes the information that's stored in SCADA, combines that with the model of the circuit, the same type of model we use to you know, build up a circuit and windmill and do different sort of things like online power flow. So it take the measurements and give you some indication of what it thinks the bulges are throughout the network. This might also be called state estimation. Um, if you have to do a reconfiguration, you'd have what's called a switch order management algorithm, which tells you how you're going to do the switching to bring things back. You would have volt var optimization, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. 
And then in Flisser, which is this is like this lecture, basically how do we respond to an outage? Uh, there's a whole lot of other applications you could have running uh, uh, under a distribution management system as well. And some auxiliary applications that you would have, depending on what sort of equipment you would have, would have be to have this mobile workforce management. So you'd have communications with your crews and you you work up work orders for, for dispatching crews to certain locations. You have advanced metering infrastructure. This is where if you had smart meters, you can communicate with these meters and bring relevant information back in, like whether there's they have power or not. You have a geographic information system, which is a mapping system, which has all the detail about your circuit. And then what we're gonna get into right now is the outage management system that given you have an outage, helps you manage your crews and your resources and figure out how you should manage your crews in order to get customers back in the service. And so this in general is um, what a lot of utilities would have. They would at least have the SCADA, um, you know, how much of this distribution management system functionality varies. But most all utilities have some software for doing the outage management process. The other thing you would have to know about would be what type of communications infrastructure I have, what can I talk to and, and how. And so you're going to have a substation local area network where all your devices uh, are going to be interconnected at the substation level. This connection to the substation could be in older systems by a phone line. But nowadays, this is usually through like microwave or through some sort of a fiber connection. And so what you would usually have is a utility usually has its own communications infrastructure. And what it would do, you would basically bring this information back to the utility infrastructure to a SCADA, and then you build applications on top of that. You can also have devices in the field on your feeder like you could have recloser controllers, you could have other type of switch controllers, you can have communications to your voltage line regulators, your capacitor banks, maybe dedicated measurements uh, on the feeder. Um, all this information you would talk to these devices through uh, what's called a field area network. Now, Utilities have different ways of connecting these devices in the field because these are sometimes at very remote locations. Sometimes this could be through a public infrastructure like using cellular communications and just use the same type of carriers you use for your phone. Or they may have dedicated radio systems set up where this is the case and they have these radios probably tied into their, um, their own utility wide area network. Um, but Keep in mind that you have all these devices that have to be talked to. And usually this is, um, I guess I would call like a star type of structure where basically you would have the target where you're trying to get this information into. And then you would communicate through all these different linkages up to the central point, the central SCADA system. So, what the outage management focuses on is it focuses on how you actually restore customers that are out of service due to something like a fault. And the type of information you need for this is you need distribution circuit connectivity. You basically need the same type of information that goes into a power flow. What you want to know, though, in this case, is if I have a customer without service, is how does that customer interconnect up all the way to the substation. So what's actually between the substation and that individual customer? So you need to know like where customers are connected. You need to know what phase they're connected to. If you have a, a customer out of service, you want to know well, what are kind of like the common customers to kind of help you find what's the, the next upstream protection device, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. And what you need is combinations of a lot of different things. Um, but what the outage management system does, first of all, is it helps you become aware of where the outages are likely at, what's causing the outage. Um, and so if you have a number of customers call in, you could trace this to a fuse or a reclose or whatever. 
So it helps you diagnose and locate the faults. The other thing the adage management system does as well is it gives you usually a mechanism for providing feedback to customers. As a customer calls in and say, I don't have service, you want some sort of mechanism for letting the customer know, well, what's an estimated time to repair? And you can, you can update that as well. Um, so you need a way of providing feedback to the customers. You need to be able to dispatch crews, uh, basically know what type of crew to send to the field and once they're in the field to kind of help direct them. Um, this helps facilitate restoration of service. And so again, you, you need to help the crews in terms of what switches might you want to open, what switches to close, so you don't create overloads and you keep the voltage within range. Um, the Azure Management System also maintains historical records. And so if you're reporting these numbers to the Utility Commission, it has a database with, with all this information on the, the duration of the outages. And then once you have all this information in your database, then you can do different types of safety and safety calculations. So you're, you're really linking a lot of different types of systems together. Not all these different systems come from the same vendor. Uh, a lot of times a crew management is a specific sub-application. Uh, meter data management is another sort of an application you have to buy from the meter vendor. You would have systems for handling customer calls. You don't really have a, a real live person answering these calls. These are automated systems where the customer can interact with the utility through the push buttons on the phone, or maybe they have some sort of voice recognition. Um, again, you'd have the work order system that would be used to help you manage your crews. And you would merge all these different applications together with the SCADA data in order to provide this outage management system functionality. And so all the large companies like the AVPs and the Siemens and the GE, they would have these outage management system software products. But a lot of the work involves in integrating all these applications together. So it's not like it, it comes all pre-packaged. It usually takes quite a bit of work in order to tie all your different substations, subsystems together. So the beginning process for a conventional outage management system would be the customer call. If you're out of service, you contact your utility used to be all through phone apps. Nowadays, they have web apps for doing things like this. You could, on a small utility, maybe have a human at the other end of the utility side. But for the most part, these are through automated voice response systems, sometimes referred to as IVR. Um, and then you will also have data through your SCADA, you know, when you have a breaker operate. Um, because of protection, the relay usually sends an event message to the SCADA system saying, well, something's happened. We had this sort of fault. I had to open up the circuit breaker. Um, you're mostly interested in knowing whether you get a lockout. So if you have reclosing operations, you can send this information if you're mostly interested in lockout. And, and nowadays, we're seeing a lot of this driven through advanced metering infrastructure where we're getting information from meters as well through what we call the outage last gasp. And so a meter, when it loses power, it has stored energy in it, usually through a capacitor, where it has enough energy to send out one last message saying, I'm out, using that stored energy in the capacitor. And that's what's referred to as a last gasp. Most of these residential meters don't have batteries. And so you'd have to store up the energy for that, for that last um, message. And ideally, ideally, if you're the utility, you'd want to know that your customers are out before the customer even has to call in. We're not quite to that point yet, but we're kind of getting to that point because of smart meters that we would actually know when the customers are out before they actually call. So when they call, we should really be at the point saying, well, we know you're out of service and, and this is how much time it's going to take to, to get you restored. Um, as far as diagnosing and locating the faults, basically what we're doing in order to do this is we're looking at all the different calls we get. And we're trying to find patterns. And so this involves knowing the electrical topology. And what we're doing 
is we're trying to find out what is the likely protection device that operated to cause that customer to be out of service. And so the fall would occur, sure. But we want to know what protection device opened up because all the customers below that protection device should be the ones that have been outaged. And so we want to see if this is an upstream transformer, like a customer distribution transformer, whether this could be a upstream fuse, whether it's an upstream recloser, maybe even if it's everybody on the circuit, it would be the substation breaker. We have to get a little bit smart about this if there's automated feeder switching, because this automated feeder switching is going to be a reflex that's going to occur like in seconds once this event happens. And so we would need to know whether there might have been some automated switching involved. Um, and then once we get all this call information and we could tr trace it to the nearest upstream protection device, then we know like how many customers are affected and where. Uh, and then what we need to basically then figure out is based on the priority of these customers, like whether they're hospitals or schools, or whatever, then you know, where are we going to want to kind of focus our efforts as far as restoring service? And then once we have all this information, um, then we can dispatch crews. And then once the crews are there, they can give us additional information as well. So this is always an ongoing process. Where you're trying to get input from all these different sources. You know, some utilities have a, um, the ability of taking input from social media and trying to figure out like how to, how to respond. So <clears throat> this, let's take a look at a, a couple different examples of, of how this topology driven process would work. And I've got a, a circuit here, two circuits from two different substations. And B is a substation breaker, R is a recloser, F is a fuse. And you see I've got normally closed and normally open switches. So I have a potentially a tie switch I could use to move load around. These triangles, these are customer distribution transformers. And let's suppose I had a fault that would occur right here below this fuse. Now, what's going to happen? Well, if a fault occurred at this location and blew this fuse, what I would expect to have happen is these customers at these locations below the fuse would call in or try to contact the utility. If only one customer calls in, that may just tell me that there's maybe a problem with the transformer, the local transformer, the service drop. So I could not really conclude that the fuse had blown just from one customer calling in. But if I have multiple customers calling in from different locations, from different customer distribution transformers, then I can start to ascertain that this fuse likely blew. So it's really, if, if utilities are looking for input, it's not good if people wait. You know, the faster people can call in, the better because what the utility is trying to figure out is what is the nearest upstream protection device which operated. So if only these customers here call, they ascertain it's a fuse. Now, if these customers call in and another customer who's on the main feeder calls in, then we start to deduce that this would be a recloser. And so this is usually how most outage management systems work. They usually assume that there's just one operation or protect the device that's causing the fault. The, the thing we run into with storms though is we can have multiple outages simultaneously and so it, it kind of makes it hard to for the outage management system to accurately track what's going on. These are really more set up for looking at one fault at a time. But once I've got this information then what I can do is I could figure out where to route the crew. Do I route the crew to this fuse location or I route the crew to this recloser? Once you know where the fault's at, then what you can do is you can start figuring out, well, what's going to be the likely time to restore? Because this is what the customer wants to know. I'm going to be without power for half an hour, for an hour, four hours, whatever. So you want to provide feedback to the customers that you're aware of a problem and what's the status on the outage response. And most utilities will have a map set up where they'll show where they they know the outages are at, and then they usually have like an, an ETR time, a time to restore 
um, which will basically tell their customers when they think that they're going to be um, where they're going to have power available again. And this is what's referred to as an ETR, estimated time to restore. And so for the case of Duke Energy in this area, let's suppose you're at NC State campus and you're in an apartment, your lights go out, you go to go to this website and then you could see like whether they know there's this outage in, in your area. And then they, you could actually see, you know, what would be the estimated time to restore. So for the FLISR process, what FLISR stands for, and different utilities use different terminology here. I like FLISR because it, it very clearly tells you what what this what this is. Um, the FL in FLISR stands for fault location. Now, before you get the location, you have to detect the fault as well. So I like talking about this in terms of the fault detection and location. You have the isolation part where you want to basically disconnect the fault, uh, at least on the high side, maybe also on the load side. So you want to get the upstream and downstream locations switched open so you can isolate the fault. And then once you've isolated the fault, then you can do the service restoration. Right? So the fault location part really is detecting the fault first. And we usually like to get this between two switches. Because then if I know I got, I can open two switches and I can send the crew or crews to those locations to get that fault isolated. The other thing that would be optional is getting the distance from an upstream measurement. And this is what we call running a fault location algorithm, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The isolation would be at least getting the open, uh, the switch opened on the source side of the fault so I can restore sections above. Um, that opened up switch. Maybe I'd be getting isolated on the load side as well below the fault. And this could be automated switches or this could be manual switches. But in, in any event, if this is not temporary, this is a permanent fault, we have to have a crew out there, get the tree off the line or fix the cable section or whatever is the nature of fault before we can um, get those customers right next to the fault back in the service. Now, when you're outside of the faulted zone, we can restore those customers. And so if it's a healthy portion of the feeder, we can restore service. And if we can get this done within one to five minutes, depending on the utility outage definition, then we don't have a SADI event. You know, that's just simply going to be still be classified as a momentary. And so the idea would be if we had automation, if we could restore within one to five minutes, then that doesn't count against us on our, our outage minutes. It's just a momentary event. So if we don't have automation, just to kind of go through this with some circuit diagrams, uh, I got a substation, I've got two feeders. I'm focusing on this feeder at the bottom. I've got potential for having reclosers and switches. These could be manual or automated, we'll assume for now they're manual. Um, what would happen if I had a fault at this particular location here on the main feeder, then what I would have to do is I'd have to have an upstream protection device operated. If I had a recloser here, then that would be that recloser that would operate open. Not all reclosers though are connected through SCADA. We have plenty of reclosers in the field, maybe they're hydraulic reclosers that don't have communications at all. And so how would we know it operated? Well, we'd have to rely on customers located in this area that would be contacting the utility. So the utility could ascertain that it's that recloser that actually operated. And so a lot of them do have SCADA, but not all have SCADA, not all communicate. So if we wanted to employ automation, you know, one thing we would want to do is perhaps replace this recloser that could be hydraulic with a newer electronic based model. And then these newer electronic based models, if they're electronic reclosers could have a radio associated with them or a cell modem. And then when, if they were going to operate, they could communicate up to SCADA. Another path to automation would be if we had smart meters with the last gas messaging, then these meters could also communicate up through the, um, the meter management system that something's going on. That information 
if it's routed to SCADA, could be used to ascertain this, that this recloser operator as well. Okay, so again, don't assume that everything in the utility has communications. That's not, that's not the case. Um, like say, if we had the communications, you know, to all these devices, it, it makes our fault detection a lot easier. But this is why sometimes or if utility was relying on customer calls, where it could take a couple minutes or more to know what's going on because if customers just assume the utility knows this stuff, that may not be the case and it delays the restoration process. For the fault location, this is a little bit different in that we know what upstream device operated, but we don't know at what position X along this slide section. So if a crew didn't know exactly where the fault was at, what they would have to do is they would typically start at the recloser and they would drive the line. Basically what they do is they start the recloser, they just drive on the road down that line section and they look for a tree in the wire. They look for some wires on the ground, right? And so this process of trying to find the fault is what's referred to as windshield time. And so we'll talk about the windshield time associated with the actual fault location. And if this primary feeder is not located on a main road, if this is going cross country across a field or through woods or whatever, this makes this process extremely time consuming. Uh, so, you know, maybe in the future we could do this, say, with drone technology. But in the past, this has been a time consuming part, especially if it's like dark and stormy conditions, makes it kind of hard for the crew to actually find the actual source of the fault. You don't want to just go to this recloser and close back in because if you got wires in the ground, that could be a safety hazard. Somebody could get electrocuted. So you want to really try to find the source of that fault, if at all possible. So with the automation, we've got some other options for this to kind of help us. One would be we would run what's called a fault location algorithm. So this recloser, for example, could measure the voltages and currents. And if it knew what the line impedance was per unit length, it could actually calculate a distance to the fault. So that's what's called a fault location algorithm. All right, that's an algorithm we can run. And most modern day biker processor based relays have these algorithms. The other thing we could do, and I'll show you this in a little bit, is we could put clamp on sensors out here that these clamp on sensors will be actuated when they see a large current associated with the fault. And so I, I could see if this sensor saw the fault and this sensor didn't see the fault, I would know that the fault would have to be between these two locations. Not only does this give me the location, but it, it, it's gonna cut down on things like mean time to switch because I know if I could pinpoint that location faster, then if I need to do some switching, I could do the switching faster. So finding this fault location quickly is important. It, it has a lot of advantages, not only just knowing where to look, but being able to respond more quickly because I can verify, you know, this is location and use this to isolate, the, then I could start the isolation process. So for fault isolation now, we, when we talked about this before with manual switches, once I know where the fault's at, say the fault's in here, if I'm not back feeding, I would at least have to have this upstream switch open. Now, if I have a recloser, that's gonna do that automatically. If I'm gonna be back feeding, I gotta operate a downstream switch. And I a lot of times have other manual switches out here that I might want to use as well, right? So if I had a manual switch upstream, I might want to open that so I can close in this recloser to get a few more loads back online. So even though the recloser operated first, we may still look for another manual switch to get us closer and have that fall section be as small as possible. The same would hold true on the load side. If there's another manual switch in here, I might want to use that. And if a switch doesn't exist, you can do what's called a line cut. 
you could just go out there and you can just clip the wire. And so if, if they're not a convenient location for a switch, yeah, you can just simply cut the wire and then splice it back together when you're done. With automation, what automation does is just automates the whole switching sequence. So I don't have to worry about opening and closing manual switches. And so if I had a fall at this location, let's suppose I had no recloser, or what would happen? Well, this circuit breaker up here would open up, right? Well, if this automated switch saw the fault, this automated switch did not see the fault, then I could ascertain that the fault must be between those two devices. And then what I could do through say like SCADA is I can open up this automated switch. I can open up this automated switch if I have communications to an automated switch. And then I would just simply close in the circuit breaker at the substation. And so to the extent I've got automation out there, I can, I can speed up this fault isolation processes as well. Now, if I'm doing the service restoration, one more thing I'm doing is having to close a tie switch, let's say, to restore customers maybe over here. Um, a lot of times this has to be done manually. Uh, once I've got the fault isolated, then I would have to have a crew go to this tie switch and close this tie switch in order to restore these customers. But again, if this were an automated switch, then instead of having the crew have to drive all the way down here, I could basically, once I have this isolated on the source side and the load side, I could just simply have a, a system operator and then close that switch. And so anyway, that, that would be the option I would have with restoration. And I could even maybe have some local logic I'll we'll talk about a little bit where this doesn't even involve the operator anymore, that this would just kind of run automatically and the operator would just be supervising this instead of actually having to, to do something. So these automated switches are designed for this purpose. You know, they're, they basically wouldn't have the ability of breaking the fault current, but once the fault's been cleared, say like at the substation, you could operate them and they would have the ability typically of breaking a load current. But what you need here is you need to have a motorized switch. You need a motorized switch and you need a controller. Now, as far as topologies, which we run into, what I've been showing you is what we call basic loops. There's just one single back feed. And probably most of your systems are like this. They're probably what we call loop control type systems. The simplest system to set up as far as logic. However, let's suppose you're in an area where you've got load, a lot of load on this circuit too much load to just simply transfer to an adjacent source. So you need to split this up. What would you do like in a more urban area? Well, what you could do is you can have two back feeds. And so what you can do if you have to supply um, load through a back feed, what you could do if you have different points is you could have some of this load go to one feed or you can have some of this load go to another back feed as well. And so this would be what we would call a three source system. So you do have some utilities in, in more congested areas, which design using this assumption. So you could split your load up to be restored between two different sources. If you want to look at the general case for this, this is more like if you're in a city, whatever, this can get very complicated. And so you could have more than two back feeds. You could have three or more back feeds. And then what you have to do is you've got to go through this complicated switching sequence to take load from one circuit, and maybe move it to three or four circuits. And this is usually where you need some type of central logic for this. This is very difficult to implement using logic in the field. So anyway, this just shows a more general scenario, more general multi back feed scenario. You know, you're not going to have to work with this, but just realize that if you're trying to move load off your original source, maybe this is going um, back to the same transformer on the same substation to an adjacent feeder. Maybe this is going to the same source to a different transformer. Maybe this is going to a completely different substation. But you have a lot of complicated options as far as opening and closing switches to, 
to restore service. Um, one last thing before we move to the hardware is I've got a breakdown that shows a lot of the different steps. An example of what would relate to your mean time to switch timing for your isolation versus your mean time to repair versus your mean time to operate the tie switch. And so if you had no automation, then you've got time for doing the outage analysis and you, know, you got to figure out that there's a fault in there in the first place and about where the fault's at. Then you got to get a crew dispatch and you, you got to see who's available and you know talk to them on the radio and get them on the way. You've got your drive time in order to get to the location from wherever they're at, if they're on patrol or if they're at some sort of a staging area. Once a crew gets there, they need to patrol the lines and figure out well, what maybe caused the fault. And then they got to go through the switching and restore process in terms of isolating a fault and restoring service to say like a back feed. Um, so that's why I've got switching time for isolating a fault and switching time for the, the back feed. Now that same crew may not be the crew that does the repair. Maybe this takes a different crew to do the repair if it's complicated. So we might have to dispatch a second repair crew. They got to repair the fall of section and they got to re restore the fall of section. Then we got to restore everything back to the original condition. So you have all these different steps and all these steps can be reduced if you can detect the fault faster if you can get the location faster, if you can get the crew dispatched faster, um, if the crew can find the fault faster, anything you could do is going to cut down on the time it takes to do the restoration. And so this just shows an example, if you have automation and you can do these things very fast, what's the difference between having no automation where everything's in terms of hours? And if you did have automation where everything, at least as far as diagnosing the fault could maybe be done in minutes and to say if you could do the switching action automatically without waiting for the crew then that can dramatically speed things up so for the fault of section it's still going to take a lot of time but at least for customers that are not tied into that fault of section permanently until the fault's repaired there's a lot you can do as far as reducing the um, the restoration time okay so in the, in the next segment, segment, what we'll do is we'll talk about more specific hardware options we can employ to, to make a, a lot of the stuff I talked about in the previous section possible.